name is Sebastian and in this video I want to show you how to structure modern enterprise Java projects. This is a question I get asked actually a lot and it's always a big question in projects and especially since there are so many examples out there for over-engineered module structures with projects with complicated builds and things like that and I want to show you well what is pragmatic what is reasonable and really effective to use in our enterprise Java projects and the biggest question already is well modules be it Java modules or Maven modules should we use them yes or no and my clear answer for that is no, especially if we're talking about a project that is a typical cloud native project or with a single deployment artifact. That means if you have, well, a Maven project or a Gradle project that basically once you build it, it boils down to a single jar file or a war file, doesn't matter, a single Java artifact then it really doesn't make sense to use any modules. So you just make it more complicated by building up some technical layering or vertical layering that all gets boiled down afterwards to just be a single artifact. There are sometimes very few exceptions to this rule, but basically start with being pragmatic, start with a single project, a single module, don't use any Java modules like the JDK 9 plus that's just a lot of lot of extra effort for very little benefit. So now you might say, no, 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 Sebastian, you're totally wrong. I'm an architect and I demand that all of this is properly layered. I say, no, don't, don't do that. You're making your life harder and there's little benefit to that. What do I mean? So typically you say, or the argument is, I would like to structure to be safer to only use uh, these modules from actually the paths that I allow or that we set up in, for example, the Maven build structure or even in the Java modeling system. But there, it's a lot of effort to set that up properly. It's less effective to work with, especially if we make some changes. And also it's very, you get very little benefits, especially if we look into what is typically called a horizontal layering here. So the, uh, these are very, very typical, especially legacy enterprise Java structures where we have either three tier for setting up some module for web and core and data. And why is this done? Well, first of all, to be you know cleaner, to have some clean separations and to say, well, it, uh, it is not allowed for the web to directly trans, uh, access the database um, in the data model or to per persistence layer and things like that. You need to go through these structures well, yes, but ultimately, if we're talking about a single deployment artifact, if that's a single application, a single microservice, monolith, doesn't matter, then there is no point in doing so. Or if you really want to be sure, you can use some other uh, tooling for your build tool to make sure that happens, such as ArchUnit or um, some tools to uh, verify that. But that basically adds a lot of extra effort and it makes developers less effective. The other thing is that for example if we had a data module that can be reused in other project this is so the promise that we can do this okay so the amount of times that i've seen this in projects is, is quite often and the, the amount of times that this really really worked is basically zero <laughs> why because the promise is that we say we build up a module that then gets reused in different projects for example something like a shared data shared core yeah, in theory, that sounds nice, but in practice, it always, well, the devil lays in the details. You have a different uh, version, maybe, of some annotations that you would like to use, or it needs to be more complex than if something changes, if something uses a um, newer version or where the version uh, diverge, then this doesn't make sense. And also, it actually goes contrary to the idea of microservices or AKA shared nothing architectures, where you say no, one application should has, have the full responsibility over its well, co code, over its structures. And then it's actually better to sometimes copy and paste a little bit rather than to try to reuse things that actually never works. So it, it is a nice idea and for architects, you know, to draw uh, all of these things and say we have clear separations. But if we're talking about a single um, project or a single artifact that then would be deployed, just don't <laughs> make a single project. And if you want to have some layering, we we'll talk about this in a second, use Java packages for them. So this is an example for horizontal uh, layering. We come to vertical layering in a second. But first of all, to answer the question, should we use modules or some sort of moduling approach for single applications? No, have a very simple setup 
with your build tool of choice and have a single structure, for example, source main Java, put all of your source code there, you can package it, uh, come to that in a second, and there we go. Okay, now for the package structures. So basically, you would like to have something um, like your project. I have some example project here. I make I open this up in the command line to be a little bit bigger. And we say we have something like source main Java and then some Java sources here, for example, for this coffee uh, example, this is uh, a Quarkus application. We have some controllers. These are then um, MVC controllers, or this is actually a Quarkus Qt. It could be a resource such as JAXRS REST resource. It could be a repository, some entity uh, uh, class definitions. So how to structure that? Well, first of all, let's go one up. This already says coffee here in my regard, so it might be a top level package or actually just a layering of, well, the package of your application. And there are two different schools of thoughts here. One is horizontal layering. So this could actually also translate to a package structure. The other is vertical layering, which is structuring, well, basically by the concerns that you have. So if you think of it like a cake, like this, so you have layers, so that cake would be a little bit wider. And then if you do vertical layering, you basically take a piece of that cake, you, uh, you cut it and then say, okay, that is well one piece of that cake that actually represents a specific component that could be you know, a module for whatever customer handling. And we'll talk about this in a second why this makes a lot of sense. But first of all, just from a navigation perspective or an understanding perspective, it makes a lot of sense to talk about this because there's this term uh, called screaming architecture that basically means, well, an architecture that screams at you what it is about. I want to show you two examples. Um, this one is just saying, okay, what is that structure? Well, you see these five names, DAOs, entities, exceptions, REST services. What does it tell you? It tells you basically nothing. You know, this is probably a Java application. Uh, when I see this, uh, these directories, it could be C sharp. Um, we're talking about REST services. Well, there are some exceptions, some entities. You have some some DAO package, whatever that means. So probably something with web and um, some services and some <laughs> databases. But that's it. It tells you basically nothing. As opposed to this structure. It tells you, uh-huh, assembly line, cars, maintenance, order, quality control. So we know that it's probably some sort of car maintenance um, or manufacturing application where we have an assembly line. We're talking about maintenance. You could probably order a car or order some maintenance, whatever, quality control. You already get some rough idea what that is about. It's the same with this term of screaming architecture, right? So you could look at a blueprint of a building and you should see, okay, this is a um, residential home. This is a football stadium. This is a gas station, whatever. Even if you don't know the color of the house, but you get a rough idea what this is about. And your package structuring should be the same. So for the Java packages, let's uh, do this real quick here as this example. If we say these are just all of the classes that we have, well, first of all, we should have a look at the layering and we can think of a vertical layering. So we say we make one Java package for customers, one for orders, one for inventory, something like this. Or for this application that we had for coffee, you know, that is, these are just coffee orders or something like that. And that's already much better and you get a good idea over the components. So first of all, it gives a better overview. And secondly, if we were to say, our monolithic application grows and grows and then we need to slice out some or carve out some subsystem to make that its own microservice. Then it's much easier if we're talking about this package structure because you basically take the whole package. It has, of course, some dependencies, but it's much easier to identify them and then to pack, uh, to package them somewhere else to see, okay, where are the compilation errors and you already have a whole package to everything that regards this subsystem. It's much easier, it's easier to understand. And also if we're talking about some changes, you know, if you say, okay, for the customer forms, we need to include a new form field for the user. Well, then typically what you do, you need a, a new form field in the front end or in this HTML, whatever have you. Then also for the, the backend service, might be HTTP, REST controller, whatever have you. It might be your core component, it might be your database, all the way down to the database um, module where then you need to um, add this field as well. So basically you have a change in a lot of um, 
parts or components of this layer or of this module of customers. Same with order, same with inventory. So as opposed to that, typically when we have even the slightest change, we need to touch all of these layers. And if they were, again, package structures for um, uh, project structures for your modules, then we would need to change three projects basically. And here is just a single one because we stay within that particular um, domain driven or domain uh, focused layer. So this makes much more sense. Okay, so about this now let's go into that specific single package that we have with coffee here. Assuming this is a single vertical um, package, I only have coffees and some, um, well, coffee representation here. If we say we also talk about customers, this might be its own package. If we talk about, well, um, shop cleaning of that coffee shop, whatever, then it might be also a different package. But now for the next question within the package, how to structure it. So if we say we have these bunch of classes within the package, how to structure that further, how to further deep um, dive? Well, depends. So then it might say, um, it, might, it might make sense to say, well, first of all, we leave it at that. It's actually a very valuable, uh, viable strategy because these are only, what, what do we have? Six, seven, eight uh, classes. So it's not too much. Actually, if you look at the Java JDK packaging, such as um, Java Time or so, they are also, it's quite manageable, right? If you look at uh, local date, something like that at the Java Time, here they even, what's that, maybe 15 or 20 um, classes. So it's not, of course, it's, it's a lot, but it's not too bad. It's, it's still manageable and it might be very valuable to say, okay, we just leave it at that. That's a pragmatic choice. That's it. Okay, fair enough. Of course, if that grows like bigger and bigger, then you might introduce some technically motivated layers or substructures, sub packages as well. So of course, we then could say we again have these services and then a core or something like um, or entities or DAO, what we uh, were seeing here. So this could be a substructure or sub packages of a top level package. This would make sense. But what I typically um, prefer is uh, this approach BCE boundary control entity pattern. So I know Adam Bean and some others uh, talk about this a lot. Um, the reason why I like this a lot, it's it's still very, very limited. It doesn't include, you know, like 20 sub packages that all include just a single class. That would be too much that, you know, that doesn't make sense. If you have a package with just a single class in it, then, you know, where's the point? But it has some separation and, you know, at the same time, it's not too much. So I think it's a somewhat a real, really reasonable middle ground. So what are these three words? Boundary control entity in the beginning, this might sound weird. Boundary basically means this is the boundary, the entry point for your use cases. So if you say, well, the starting point of the whole thing, if we're talking about, you know, some coffee, order some coffee, then this would be something like a coffee shop class where you have a method order coffee. So basically, typically in enterprise Java, this would be a bean might be Spring Bean, might be Quarkus, Application Scope Bean, something like this. Entity, on the other hand, are the domain entities, basically the nouns, the objects that we have, something like coffee order, something like customer, any well, anything that you work with. These are typically data transfer objects or persisted to the database, where we say, well, this is a JPA at entity, so hence also the name that matches really, really well, or a domain-driven design entity or a value object in domain-driven design this all goes there. And by these two, this is already a very nice like separation. And then of course, if your business use case is so complex that then you say, well, the handling of a certain use case should be outsourced, delegated to some other classes, you know, some other at application scope beans, some other dependent beans, whatever scope you use in CDI or in your spring dependency injection, that goes into control, into that package. So if we had the structure here, and I just quickly want to uh, show this to set this up. If we say, well, um, coffee, then we have, for example, let's start with uh, the coffee controller and the coffee resource, and then of course the coffee shop. So the coffee shop is somewhat the most obvious one where I say, okay, let's move this um, to a package boundary. I want to create this, yes. And then also the coffee itself, that is definitely an entity that goes into entity. And I think it might even be the only entity we have right here. 
And then also that's a question what then we would like to move further. So coffee repository, so that's definitely a control. So we put this into a control package and then we already have all packages. And typically if I have to substructure, then I want all classes to be uh, somewhat defined there. So what I also um, usually do, you might argue about this, but I think it's uh, pragmatic to do um, to put all of the rest controllers into boundary as well. So then this is the entry uh, point. So this is already quite reasonable, I would say. Now we have this structure, boundary, uh, all of the entry points to our use cases, well, plus technical HTTP uh, controllers. Then we have control with our repository. Then here what we do, we have health and re root resource. I would say it's quite uh, reasonable to just leave health, not even under coffee, but maybe in the top level package of our application. So if we only have one, well, it doesn't matter. But if we have coffee and something else, because health regards everything, same for root resources. Sometimes you have something like an exception handler where you just say, okay, this resides in a, a top level package. Just, you know, don't be overly, um, overly strict with this, it can just be very pragmatic. So I could even leave it like that or you say, okay, root resource might be in the boundary. If we have a different um, top level package as well, just leave it there or under the application package, whatever have you. So I would even uh, leave it at that, um, how this is. Now, typically there are some general rules there. So for example, if you are in the entity package, it generally doesn't make sense that the entity would then invoke something from the boundary package, right? Because that would be, while well, the entity is kind of calling another use case invocation. This typically doesn't make, make sense. You want to go from top down, something like this. So if you want to take this further, you can include some rules that you say, well, a boundary should generally not call another a boundary that should be done by a boundary control and then a control can invoke another control also from a different uh, top level package from a different vertical package so you might want to include some rules there that for this i want to uh, i would then include using a tool such as arch unit uh, where you say okay i define some rules from the package structures so why would you do this? Well, then you enforce some rules that are a little bit similar um, to what you would do with a module structure if these were multiple modules, because then you can define them in code. Um, so with a tool such as ArchUnit um, in Java, that's also possible. Um, but it, it really depends if you want to do this. But I would not make the developers less effective by imposing some module structures that then actually slows down your development process because you have multiple things to handle. Of course, you can invest a lot of time to make that faster again, but really what is the point? I would argue be pragmatic there with your structuring and then this is just faster. Okay, so this is basically about the substructures within a single vertical package. I would use this package, but whatever you prefer, you can come up with a different naming, but I just think this way of thinking makes sense. And then we don't have too many packages and it's somewhat, you know, obvious. Okay, then one more thing, because I also get the question a lot about test structures. That's another uh, very interesting uh, thing about just how to, well, define um, some structures of packaging for our code level test, for our system level test, uh, things like that, Java packages, um, naming, what should we use there? So first of all, well, our code level tests, these are all of the actual tests that regard the code level. Of course, the unit tests, sometimes you have code level integration tests, such as, you know, the, your spring tests or Quarkus tests, things like that. They, of course, have to reside in the same project. So typically, um, that's something like, um, source test and then source test Java, something like this. So where we say, okay, we have, well, the structure, of course, they need to reside in the same project. Otherwise you couldn't, well, access to code. So that's uh, quite clear. But then when it comes to system level tests, and these are all of the tests that basically regard your system sort of as a black box or gray box, where you say you connect to the system from the outside. In most of the cases, I actually want these tests to not reside in the same uh, project and there are reason for, uh, reasons for that. So what I typically say I would like to have 
an own system test project. So don't get me wrong, this is not another module that then you uh, build up again. This is actually an own independent project. It has nothing to do with the other projects. They don't have any code dependencies. And that's good. I want that. I don't want them to have any dependencies. Why don't I? Because I could reuse some code definitions and say I use the same transfer objects for adjacent structure or something like that to be faster. No, I don't because um, sometimes this happens when you say you change this JSON structure on one way by renaming some class and then it automatically updates the fields that actually makes you break the API contract. And if you would like to test this in a system test project, so here my system test project is yet another a Maven project, but again, uh, just standalone, we can have a look at the POM um, XML definitions here. These two have nothing um, in common with each other, so they are just... Uh, very different with playground system test. They don't have any code dependencies. This is just, well, JUnit, some, um, it might be uh, here's some HTTP client, where, however you would like to connect to your application, things like that. It uses uh, just some JUnit uh, dependencies here, very basic, and that connects to my application. Something like an external client that has no uh, connection to your application. It could even be written in a different technology, different programming language. So this is how I would like to think of them. Why? Because then you really have the separation of saying, I don't really don't want to know anything from my application. It would still need to work using my system test and testing these contracts and APIs because then you're just a little bit safer and you're um, kind of similar to what a user would do. Okay, then sometimes you say this is either too slow or I have different sort of scopes of tests and my code level integration tests take too long. Okay, first of all, I would say that's a different issue and you should solve that first. So all of the code level tests and actually also the system uh, level tests should run fast. So you shouldn't need to separate some sort of suites of tests just by the test runtime. Sometimes you have to, but basically let's uh, try this out. If I say I have something like Maven, um, where I invoke all of the unit tests or the code level tests with verify, they should run fast. So this takes three seconds. That's even one time. Let's try this again. Um, where under this machine, if it's fast enough, well, two, three seconds, something like this, that's kind of okay. So they should invoke, and that's all of the tests. Okay, here I only have one, but basically it should not increase the time if I have uh, many, many more. Then you should refactor that. That's a different story, and I have a whole video course on this, but you know, you get the point. Now, what you can do is to separate them into packages or naming structures if you have to, and then you could say you invoke them differently. So for example, in your IDE, in the Surefire plugin, and also in the Quarkus development mode, if you happen to use Quarkus, it is possible um, to say, well, I would like to run the tests and then also define some certain, um, well, uh, patterns, what is being executed. So what I'm showing here is the Quarkus development mode with the continuous testing. So here, if I run my tests, they're super fast, just a few milliseconds. So if you happen to use Quarkus, there's another thing that you might want to know just in terms of structuring this, if you have to, what I would do then is to do something like um, Quarkus.test.include pattern or exclude pattern. So the exclude pattern out of the box exclude is being set to only, well, to exclude the ITs, the integration test. That's the same what Maven does out of the box from the Maven convention. If you set this to empty, like what I'm doing here, you, um, it restarts the Quarkus development mode with the testing. And then you can say, well, now it runs also, I have some smoke integration tests, some smoke tests that just connect to my application via HTTP and then um, basically does something. The reason why this is an IT is that using the usual Maven package command, it's not executed. It's, a, it's, it's either a different command or I have to especially uh, explicitly include it, what I did here now. So two things you want to know if you use Quarkus, exclude pattern and include pattern, then you can have a pattern what you would like to run. That's what I wrote here. So if besides this structure and separating code level tests and well system level tests, if you need more structuring or more separations of saying, okay, I have different suites, the UI test run really slow, things like that. What I would do is to have some packages or naming convention of your test that you call them UI integration tests or something like this, where then you explicitly include or exclude in the way how you would like it. 
You know, you can set this up in your IDE, you can set this up as we've just seen with the Quarkus command line. Also with Maven, you can say, okay, um, include the specific tests for the failsafe plugin or the Surefire plugin, you can do all of that. This is what I would do before you set up more modules than, than what we just have. So in general, to summarize it, I would really, while well, refrain from uh, using these module structures for an enterprise project that basically boils down to a single deployment artifact and keep it simple here, keep it pragmatic or reasonably pragmatic. Sometimes there are technical requirements why to split this up or sort of technical requirements where I say I have some different test suites that I want, okay but you can still use Java packages and namings and then you know set it up in your build pipeline or CI CD pipeline for well running it in the way how you want it. And this is what I think really makes sense for structuring effectively modern enterprise Java projects. So again, to sum it up, try to not use any modules, neither Maven or Gradle or Java modules. Keep it simple, keep it in a single project, use vertical layering, Use things like boundary control um, entity packaging for the technical layering inside your Java packages. So you should have these structures with Java packages. And then for some test structures, if you need them, it may really makes sense to have a separate system test uh, project that tests um, or mo multiple of them, if you have different sort of scopes um, that tests your, um, your enterprise projects from the outside. But other than that, you could just set it up using some main naming conventions and especially using packages. If you need more stricter conventions, then I would use some tooling that as part of your build type uh, pipeline, make sure that your Java structures use the code in the way how you want it to be. So I think this makes sense. If you can be more productive and this also makes the whole thing more fun because you can spend most of the time coding actually and not setting up well build tools. So I hope this was helpful. Let me know what you think about that. I'm really curious to hear your opinion. You can comment something down below. And I would really appreciate if you like the video and subscribe to my channel. And thanks a lot for watching. Bye.